Uh, I'm going to read uh, four or five poems from the Emily book, and then uh, a poem that I'm finishing all my readings with uh, for, for this year. Um, the first one I'm going to read is Emily as the Audacity of the Red Egg uh, for Sam Roxas Chua. The sun is never white. The chest collects only breakable bones. Each new day carries with it a tribe. So native to this moment, the wars do not have time to fill our throats with a second cry. I look to focus my eyes on the landscape and the fog that once hugged Ohio charges me. I relax my gaze and I see Emily as a red egg paused on the impossible tip of love. I see her in defiance of all want. A table cannot starve. Wow. Um, I got, uh, and Christian, this will hit home a little bit for you, buddy. <laughs> um, I got uh, some uh, emails from professors at Miami uh, when all the Emily poems started getting published. And uh, one of them very explicitly said, you should stop writing those. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> no, absolutely not. That yeah. first one, the one you just read was a longer Emily poem for you. For yeah. yeah. From the uh, ones that I've published anyway. Yeah. I'm going to read one. I've, I've, I like the longer ones. Let's I've, go. I've, I've <laughs> um, so in a response to one of my professors telling me to stop writing these, uh, I sent them only this, this next poem as a response. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, as I hold three of her shoes. I would write poems about swans if I gave a shit about swans. The swans you're thinking of, do they have anything to do with Emily? <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so here was the thrush one I was going to read. Uh, Yay! <laughs> and it is, it, is, it is a short one. This is Emily as our lust is a common lust. Seriously. It's almost all buttons. <laughs> That's right. I remember that poem. It just, it just makes me happy. It just makes me Hi, happy. Hi, Julia. <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to read two more Emily ones. The next one is Emily is a Book of Endings. I was very obsessed with uh, Leslie Harrison's book, uh, A Book of Endings. Um, and yeah. thank you for about the six months. I kept rereading it over and over again. <laughs> uh, I, I sent her this poem. Uh, and it, it has been blessed by Leslie, so we are, we are, we are good to go with this one. Um, Emily is a book of endings. I chose Emily because I knew that if she chose me, I could prepare for death in a way that made my desperation to keep living something tangible. Now, with each child we have, I am cemented in the panic of the living. Now, since she keeps choosing me every morning, I am able to taunt mortality in a way that will leave claw marks in the fields of Ohio. How glorious it will be to be dragged from the living and to scream one name, to spit one name at my weakening grip, to expect the strength to return to me just like the thousands of other times I've used her name to live longer. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, and to the last one, there's uh, a lot of a lot of uh, truth and a lot of lies in this book. It's it's fun to mess with both of it. Um, <laughs> this 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 one is the closest one to uh, something that uh, actually happened uh, entirely this way. Um, this is one of the last poems in the book, and as the publisher told me, uh, this is the poem that uh, got the book published. So I'm always going to be sentiment sentimental for this one. Oh sure. <laughs> Emily as a smile would have ruined the picture. There was one look, one picture of Emily in a bathtub right before we got married. She was traveling with her family. She was in Madrid or Paris or Istanbul. She had been gone for a couple of weeks. So I had been drunk for a couple of weeks and she knew that I had been drunk for a couple of weeks. So she sent me a picture of her in the bathtub, one breast covered, hair in a way I had never seen before, looking directly at the faucet. And so surely the tatters of my world collected into a whole woman so beautiful that when I got the picture, I accidentally deleted the picture. I remember it clearly though, her face elegant, 
angry that she didn't have her hands wrapped around the back of my head to pull me off the bottle. She wanted to bury me in her beauty, and that almost worked too well. I am sober. I don't have that picture. I have Emily. She looks at me now. That's um, Woo! Uh, thanks darren who wants to go next anybody (laughs) you guys choose i'm just hanging (laughs) i'll go next okay okay so um the first poem i'm gonna read is uh from my poem that was in thrush that was in my book uh chime which is right here So it came out last year. So um, the poem is sort of the, what I call the title poem. It's called, The Black Body is a Wind Chime. Hmm. Perfect for whistling bullets through. Singing discordant yet delicious screams. Symphonic scent of burning flesh. Climbing Kilimanjaro, leaving trails of blood. The black body is a piccolo, blown into but never kissed. Blistering white lips race to apply breath to it, but never desire real intimacy. Muscular music makes men mad with black notes filling their nostrils. String the black bearskin bamboo together and call them bones of holy ghosts, sold on the auction block to the highest sinner. A chanting wind whips resistance through them. I love, I just want to say this. When I first read that poem, when Len first sent it to Thrush, it made me cry and I'm trying to hold back tears right now. So we can go ahead. That's how I choose most of my poems. Go on. Oh my gosh. I might cry right now. Okay, that's okay. We'll all cry together. <laughs> and then we'll put it on Facebook so everybody can see us. <laughs> okay. Um, the rest of these are fairly new. And um, so I'm just going to start rattling these off here. Some of them are, are short. So this is called Black Boy's Fifth Grade Homework. If your neighbors have a whites-only treehouse, Do you protest so that you can be admitted to the treehouse or do you build your own treehouse? Response, I will plant my own trees. Okay. This one is called Love Me Like Your Guns. I'm as black as they. I'm your trophy above the mantle. I'm your side piece in your holster. I'm your gift and your right from almighty God. Grip the neck of this coveted steel. I'm your dirty letters and naughty numbers. AR-15, nine millimeter, your 45. Rat-tat-tat-tat me. Block, blam, blow into the early morning. Your Saturday night special. I'll take load after load, one bullet at a time. Twirl me around on your finger and lick my barrel before squeezing me tight until I explode. Wow. Whoa. Okay. So this next one is... uh, called Alternate Ending to Drain You. Are you guys familiar with the uh, Nirvana song, Drain You? Yeah. yeah. I so, think all uh, like Nirvana here. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I probably should have worn my Nirvana shirt. But anyway, uh, so I decided to do a poem uh, about that. So the epigraph is basically the last lines to the song, which say, uh, chew your meat for you, swap it back and forth in a passionate kiss. From my mouth to yours, sloppy lips to lips, you're my vitamins. Mm -hmm. Molars crash together, mouths gaped like a pond, tongues hook up like Legos, speak in a lumbata steps, 
build a bridge of enzymes between fractured hearts. Capes of lightning flash in our purple cheeks, never closing again, jam together in you until meteors strike. Open your eyes and watch. Push the meat with my tongue down your slippery throat. Wash it down with blood from my cracking lips. Gnawed by your baby's breath, you're my bottomless well. Grabbing locks of hair from each other's scalp. Pushing me through you, devouring you in me. Praying to your lungs, don't give out on me. Reaching for your womb, planting my kiss inside. Watch our sea grow there. Doesn't she look like you? You're my angel tree. Fly me to your roots. I like you. <laughs> That's lovely. All right, I guess I'll do a couple more. Um, so I was uh, researching this uh, photograph of um, a former slave named Gordon who escaped a Louisiana plantation to uh, a Union Army camp. And it's, a, it's like an iconic photo because uh, he has the lacerations on his back. I've probably seen it, I don't know if you have, but you can Google like Slave Gordon and see the photo. So um, I wrote a couple of poems about that and I'll end with both of these. So they're both called Gordon. After photo by William D. McPherson and Mr. Oliver, 1863, CDV by Matthew Brady. What grace emerged from scars made by the whip, tattoos inscribed with blood ink, branded with the heat of leather, a matrix of ones and zeros rippling through black skin cyberspace, spider's web with the arachnid hiding beneath the epidermis. Mountain range where mercy was found dead on its craggy cliffs. The signs on each peak read, do not touch. Braille dots for the racially impaired to finally see the horror they'd wrought. Lattice of wings that sang, I'll fly away when I die, hallelujah by and by. Banks carved out for rivers of tears. <clears throat> Pour them down his spine and witness waterfalls. Chase him through this briar patch. He be brer rabbit and they be brer fox. Make a tar baby out of his skin. They ensnare only themselves. They wore out their arms on his back, but the runaway never got tired. He lives forever. Follow the trails on his back to freedom. And so this last one has sort of a, a speculative fiction feel to it. So um, like I said, it's called the same Gordon. And I have an epigraph from Virginia Hamilton's The People Could Fly. And it says, uh, they say the people could fly, say the people who could fly kept their power, although they shed their wings. Africans and their descendants sold into slavery had special abilities. Gordon could create a GPS with the scars on his back. One needed only to place a hand on his back and the path to freedom emerged. He was a North Star, bright as the morning. They called him Whip Peter, but his mutant code name was The Compass. This is how he found the Union camp after escaping from his Louisiana plantation. But he went back and helped more of his brethren escape. Of course, he could no longer live among them on the plantation, so he camped in swamps among alligators and moccasins. The freedom seekers sought him in the trees or under the surface of the river, but he found them running for their lives as he had. He sued their panic with the treasure map patterns on his back. He embraced them with black skin crop circles. He placed their hands on him and they beheld his glory. He was a gift from above, living like John the Baptist, lonely, often hungry, but never afraid. He knew his calling was greater than the master's whip. 
He knew even when he was tied to the overseer's post, feeling the leather burn grace into his flesh. He knew when the tears streamed into the corners of his mouth. He knew when his screams echoed through the southern wilderness, back across the ocean, onto the African shores, and to the tribes that birthed him. He saw them with every clapping slice through his back, cracks of prophetic lightning to his soul. They appeared vividly. They chanted with heavy breaths. They blew plumes of smoke into the air and the fog spelled out his name. He knew where he came from. He knew he had to liberate his people from bondage. They were already free. They were a nation. Setha Suggs had a tree growing out of her back. It could reach into space with unborn babies and ancestors hovering on every limb, warring with a ghost who ate at its roots. But Gordon the Compass had a rocket on his back. Like an ambassador to the cosmos, he told every brother and sister he found, touch me. I'll take you wherever you want to go. Those were beautiful. Thank you so much, Len. Wow, Len. Thank you. Ooh, who wants to go next? <laughs> I can go. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Emily Corwin. Uh, I'm going to actually start with a poem that's not by me. Um, this is by... Molly Brodak, who was a poet and memoirist who passed recently this last week. Um, so yeah, this is, um, this is her poem called The Flood, which was published with Poetry Society of America. The Flood. Panic because suddenly everything signifies a kind of net of sunlight pulling all directions at once. The background's flaw is that it beckons. The poodle's boat, Noah's palm, the dove magnet, a barbarity, a flame at the vanishing point, where things trace back to one man's wanting, which is often the wrong thing for him altogether. So people drowned, their things emptied of humanness, made violent in the deaf water, became filth. Get used to it, Noah told his sons drunk, sad as God, in a story. The first to die are the ones who don't tell stories. The rest fish in a soul that narrows defensively into a corridor that exits the arc into the awful future, half magnetic, half veil. So that was a poem by Molly Brodak. Uh, yeah, she, she was She's very an amazing shy. poet. Hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, sorry. I, I, it, I, I haven't read that poem before, actually, at all. And I just found it quickly before the reading and thought, yeah. this looks awesome. Sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm, just, I'm, blown, I'm blown away by her own work reading it out loud. Um, so I'm going to read my poem uh, that was also published at Thrush. And it's from my new book. Woohoo! Yay! <laughs> Yay! Um, so this is Sensorium. It's out April 7th, though. I've been told that um, pre orders are already coming in and arriving to people, which is awesome. Um, so this is Notes to Self. Um, yeah, Notes to Self. Maybe I should stay up late and destroy myself. Pop my polyester blouse diaphanous and spray ammonia on my computer and then it dies. In summer, I gasp in utter horror at my freckles, mistake them for unspecific bugs. Remember, the mushrooms in the quadrangle are not trash, despite the sheen on them like stale bread loaves. And in my phone, there is my demon. I clean him from the data cache, though he won't be disappeared for long. Is it safe to eat a peach with bruise? under, peach with visible cellular damage. I squash a hot spoon on this horsefly bite. In the sterling, I recognize myself like a magpie with a mirror test. I think I know why you threw me away. Um, so I think that might be the only one. Oh wait, I have a short one in here that I realized the other day. I was gonna say that might be the only one I'll read from this book. Um, yeah, so I was 
looking back through this and I remembered that I had a poem that felt kind of eerily relevant to what's happening now. Um, I wrote this after the 2016 election, but um, it feels relevant now as well. Residents in a time of horror. It was something gloomy out there in the gloaming in the ground that gives, ground that takes. Yes, it is a brutal planet we have. It says, danger, do not enter. In what direction are you running, love? Did it hurt to be outside? Under the local meadow, blood invades, the virus moaning delicious into wilder life. What is there to do but tremble, become a softer element, supple, foraging for antidote, a small ardent berry to reside here, to resist. Okay, so that's all I'll read from Sensorium. Um, I'm very excited about this collection. Uh, if you really like horror movie poems and acrostic <laughs> writing, you will really love this book because about, <laughs> about half of it is uh, horror movie acrostic poems. Um, so I've been doing a lot of writing while at home for the last week. Um, I've started a new project. I have mental illness. I have a uh, generalized anxiety disorder. Everyone has the book. Got the book. Yes, yes, <laughs> yay. <laughs> um, I've been doing a lot of writing this last week um, about mental illness. I have a uh, generalized anxiety disorder and I'm trying to, I like challenging myself with forms. So I've been doing these little, uh, Lunatic as abecedarian, lunatic as acrostic, lunatic as sonnet, lunatic as pastoral, etc. I think I've got like 15 different forms lined up. So uh, I've gotten, I think I have, I've written like six poems at this point. I've had a lot of time on my hands. Um, but these are all fairly short. Um, so yeah, this one is lunatic as abecedarian. And if you don't know, an abecedarian is a poem in which um, I'll just show you. It's, it's hard to explain, but the, the first letter of each line, if you read it going this way, um, reads the alphabet. Okay. Lunatic as abecedarian. All along I lived against it, a brutal music. I lived in it in clinics, in dresses disposable. They withdrew my data in vials, in miniature cylinders embossed with enzymes. I am prescribed fluoxetine. I take two at evening, my cluster of gowns, shuddering back in rapture. The pill is part hydrochloride, part chloroplast in plastic, part iodine. I have been ill all this time, the mind jagged as slabs of labradorite. I kneel against the laminate, Fantasize myself lobotomize, despise the belly of the valley uncanny, the moving corpse. It crosses me like stinging nettle, upsetting. I fret over omens, imagined or otherwise. Add to my wish list, poplin dress, also heels made of methacrylite, so many quarts of medicine into my serotonin receptors. I cannot accept you as elsewhere, as nowhere, into the sarcophagus, caskets of black tourmaline. Too much SSS, ugh, too much SSRI equals sleep, too much caffeine equals ulcer. I pop omeprazole like an anti-venom. My denim makes me rustic as a woodsman. I saw myself in half. Xanax is a miracle. I mean, just yesternight, I slept all night long, a long crystal zirconia. I lived, but it was wicked, and I was wicked too. So that was the Abyssinarian. Um, these next ones are very new, like from the last couple of days. Um, lunatic as acrostic, meaning that the again the first the first letter of each line is spelling something out. So I think I looked at the Latin root for lunacy, and it's lunaticus. Um, so that's what it spells out. Um, lunatic as acrostic. Lower than inferno, I'm underneath the underworld. How I curl up like hair tendril, ribbon, sapling. My narcosis broken at least at last, and so I will go, aching in the acre of quaking aspen. 
all the toxins that slither come hither in clotted incantation become become chrysanthemum my hollowed ground a hall of blood unburied i am an uproar core myself like a market apple the seeds the cyanide inside each pip each poisoned waterbed that's beautiful. And this is very new. Uh, this is Lunatic as anti-pastoral. Um, it started as a pastoral, but I haven't been seeing much nature lately, so it's an anti-pastoral, and the title is inspired by a poem of this uh, similar title um, called Anti-Pastoral by Vivi Francis. Um, so yes, Lunatic as anti-pastoral. It's quarantine, and so no pasture roses, no trilliums, no wild pinks, no hepatica or slender nettle, welted thistle, horse mint, or roadside pepper grass. And so no star grass either, or false heather, doll's eyes, blue lettuces, eye bright, bed straw, small woodland orchis, no jimson weed or jack in the pulpit, and also no scrub oak, no American bittersweet. There is no clearing into which I can lay supine my undersides, dashed up to my neck in pearly everlastings, hands lengthening all across my face. Thank you all. Thank you, Emily. So good. Yay. <laughs> Congratulations on your book. Yeah! <laughs> Who's next? <laughs> I'll go in case the baby wakes up. Or That's a great excuse. <laughs> I was like trying to gauge when he was asleep enough for my voice to be audible. <laughs> it's just... Oh, and then my books have vanished. Because my life is... Someone else go. Now I have to go find my <laughs> I, I just wanted to say, it's so wonderful to hear like, I think there's two extremes. The one extreme of you're by yourself and so you have all this time to produce. Right. And the other extreme is you're a mother and you have no time to even right. breathe, let alone think about poetry. So right. now I'll find I understand. <laughs> so who wants to go? Julia's go to tend to the kitties. <laughs> I can go if Julia's gonna take a take a break. Can you hear me? Um, can everybody hear Caitlin? Mm. Sort of. Yeah. Well, I'm not wrong with my audio. Hmm. That's hey, I, Glenn, are you the master Zoomer? That's a I little bit better, but phone not all the way. I don't know why. Can anybody hear her at all? No. Nah. I don't think we can, any of us can hear you now. I found my books because I'm silly. So I can go if- Caitlin, want do you want Julia to go? Well, okay, because she's having audio issues. Okay. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for this. I just want to say, Helen, thank you so much. I feel oh, like- Oh, thank you know, guys. I, I love this. Um, I didn't know how necessary it was until being here and hearing all of you. I um, completely agree with that. And I, every time somebody's reading anything, I'm like, oh God, I'm so glad I did this. <laughs> um, I, I kept trying to find uplifting poems because I feel like we really need to hear uplifting things right now. Um, and I have so few that are uplifting, but I have managed to find uplifting ones. Um, so this is from my book, The Many Names for Mother, um, that came out this past September. Um, as the cat tries to knock down the lamp, <laughs> what else could happen? My son's going to wake up as soon as he hears me say anything. Um, all right, so this is Why Walk When We Can Fly. Toilet paper wings trailing behind him. My son flaps through the house. He's unraveled the entire roll in seconds. That's all it took to leave so much white behind. On the floor and in the air and in his hands. 
that's how he burned, I think. Icarus, that is. But my son isn't reaching for the sun yet, and I haven't taught him intent that arms transform when they move that quickly, that the body is always just an instant away from becoming something else, from leaving the ground or returning to it. And he falls on his knees or face, flat to the hardwood, falls without knowing how it happened and rises having forgotten he ever fell. Maybe we need to do that too, to forget or fall more, to move against the past instead of towards it. Because underwater, the wax must have congealed back to wings around him as the backward sun swallowed the whole bird of him, clouds and body strewn inside out left white and bare as the hottest part of a dying flame, or a star maybe, one we watch night after night, forgetting it must have died so long ago to still trail the sky. Um, and this is, um, other Women Don't Tell You, and it's the first Other Women Don't Tell You poem that I ever wrote. Uh, and then I wrote a whole bunch of them because there's a lot of stuff Other Women Don't Tell You about motherhood, <laughs> pregnancy, and the body. Um, and it's really bizarre reading this poem to you today um, because my daughter just turned nine months yesterday, mm -hmm. and this is when my son turned nine months. So it's, it's a really strange feeling to be going through all this again. Right. Um, other women don't tell you about the hair, how it falls out, webs between your fingers and streams in the shower and clumps on your pillow and on the floor and in the hands of one who still loves you. They say it'll grow back, thicker even, but you don't believe them. They've lied before. And they don't tell you about the split, how you can fit a fist between your left and right sides. You can work to make it narrower, they say. Build back the muscle in your abdomen and pelvic floor. You can get it all back, they say. But you know that's not the point. And you knew that you'd be tired that the body can only keep up for so long. They say the days would be long and the years would fly, but again, they were wrong because everything is flying and the rain is coming down the way July had never known it. And you think my body was an ark once and you ask, would it still float? And in days, your son will have breathed air as long as water. And maybe Noah was a woman too. They never told you any of this. But the rain is coming and you are holding a wad of your own hair in one hand as your son's head rests against the other. And you think they never told you any of this how your hands would never keep up. Ooh. And man, my head is, sh my head and my hair is shedding, I think worse the second time around, guys. It's bad. <laughs> it's like you just go like this and it's so much hair. Um, so in this book, I have another series um, of poems that's called While Everything Falls Apart, Imagine How You'll Blank. It started, you know, shortly after the election. <laughs> um, so while everything falls apart, imagine, and my phone is, why is my world just falling apart? It's my child's daycare texting because all the kids miss each other. That's what's <laughs> happening right now. Just so you get a taste. <laughs> this whole reading is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> right into your life. Agree. <laughs> um, while everything falls apart, imagine how you'll teach your son about love. Repeating, gentle, gentle, remind him how to touch and not bite back. Whew, sorry. <laughs> when he's intent to leave his teeth inside, 
to take your hair with him to bed and keep on screaming for even more of you when there's so little left. The bears sleep warm inside the earth. You sing so close they cannot tell where one's skin ends and the soil begins. The trees reach for the moon, you sing, and all the birds sleep warm and quiet. You hold him still against your chest and lips, against his will sometimes, and hum lost Yiddish of the small boy orphan singing papyrosen, koifsche, koifsche, papyrosen, to get warm. Or of the Russian beggar girl with her garyachi bublichki, as the unbearable night moves in like a train against the dying oil lamp. Bublichki, garyachi bublichki, hot rings of dough. The name you called him when he grew that hot and round inside your belly. You taste them as you sing and as you kiss his father long and hard. And every time you speak of love, you mean it. Lublu, Liebe, Liebe, and every time your son extends to hug a stranger, you're afraid the cradle will rock and grateful the wind blows, afraid, always afraid, the bow will break every time he reaches with the whole of him. You wonder if he learns through the vibrations between your mouths, if he noticed the woman begging you for money had no teeth. If he heard her singing, squeezing your stroller wielding arm, gentle, gentle singing, baby, darling, thank you for your smile, for believing her. The big night stirs snow. With a spoon you sing, your neighboring bears swim beside the moon. You sing, you sing, you sing so when his mouth opens, it will be full, gentle, gentle, animal. I haven't read that poem in a really long time. That um, was a really beautiful poem. <laughs> um, I was kind of overwhelmed by how relevant it is as I'm, you know, going on walks with my son and constantly telling him not to run up to strangers because yeah. it's so hard for him. He's such an extrovert. Um, and he's a four-year-old that still hugs strangers. Right. He's been really good. Um, um, so I'm going to do um, one more. Um, and this is from my brand new book, Don't Touch the Bones, that is launching virtually right now. I've never read <laughs> it. Um, so I'm really excited because I get to hold it and open it. It doesn't have like any, you know, stickers or anything because I've never read from it before. Um, so this will be the last one. Um, and this is called Phalanx Bone Shehianu, which Shehianu just means blessing. Um, so this is a blessing to the phalanx bone. Praise these, your fingers, their tiny bones, each one a tooth, a needle, a loosening and reach, named for how far they grow away from you, for their distance from your other bones, from your body or mine, the one closest to your palm, proximal, phalanx, a surrender, a shield, the subsequent, a phalange, something I can't understand, like your pinky toe, too small to lodge inside my heart. But there it is, the smallest part of you, forever there, keeping time and beating. You laugh and push your whole foot in my mouth. How funny that it fits there so completely that you love knowing it has a home inside. Then the middle bone and distal one, together they are everything your hands can hold and everything your feet may tread on. Together they are everything I'm made of, bone of my bone, blood of mine and not mine. Praise, praise these, your tiny bones. 
They are what God must have meant with every exhale. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Julia. Oh, beautiful poems. Okay. okay, who wants to go next? Caitlin, you have mute on, just so you know, in case. There it is. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Can, Can everybody hear Caitlin? Yeah. Okay. I had to hold the cat because they're fighting. One cat is fighting another cat. So now. That happens in my house every night. And before you guys got on, I warned Len it could get ugly. <laughs> <laughs> they go at it. And they're brothers. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> If I release this one, I can read. Should I read? Okay. Please read. This is so cool. I'm so glad that my audio is working and that we can do this. This is a very unique experience. No. We can't hear you, Caitlin. We can't hear you. Can anybody hear her? No, I could have said no. I don't hunt. No, no good. No audio. No, no, you're I, good. That yeah, was good. That was good. Oh, okay, you're good. good. So good. I thought somebody was like, I can't hear you. Um, so deer season is a much bigger thing here than I remembered from when I was growing up because I don't hunt. Um, so this poem is called Deer Season, and it starts with an epigraph from Verna Herzog. You have to know what a good amount of the population is watching. The poet must not close his eyes, must not hurt them. Dear season. I'm like a doctor, said the customer service agent. Can he fix the sucking wound in the sky? I wonder, or the spilled wine gash that necklaces the young does throat. The free market fills with smoke and orange camo. I can help you out today, he says. Tomorrow I will have 50 additional channels. Each one holograms the dark TV, a beady little eye. Um, I've written a series of poems that begin with the title, Letter to My Long Distance Lover, blah, 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 um, at the end of a bad relationship. And this is one that appeared in Thrush, and I'm very, very excited. Um, to have it there, to have a home right there, and not on Netflix anymore. So um, this is Letter to My Long Distance Lover, in which we're Ross and Rachel. Russell Stover and the other women you preferred, on the counter of Hudson News, a box. There is no love, just the card you made out with a stranger's pen. When we get back, no monkeys watch us make love to your answering machine. Caitlin? I think we lost her. Yeah, I, I, does anybody hear like they did. Cowardice and canned laughter fill the hours. Commercials squeaking, please just love me, front and back, the break. Watching him sleep on 18 fringed pages, but he isn't. Awake, all the babies are only bad dreams. The icicles weep like old mothers, and it must be spring. Um, okay, this one is called Suffer Better. My partner taught me this charming phrase about women, women athletes. They are sometimes said to suffer better than men do with injuries and things like that. Um, and so that knowledge gave me the title for this poem called Suffer Better. That's what women do. Run along the beach that turns their muscles to satin tatters. The child that runs them, moon through cloud film, now playing in theaters near you. Plot points disappear. Say no while a man puts the child inside you. Suffer better. 
win an Oscar just a few miles farther. The sun sets on the waves that sometimes swallow tourists where they stand. They do not suffer. Or this is what we tell the children who turned us to bramble. Don't scream when the tide takes you, when the knee gives, when the boyfriend makes you call him partner to burn the scorn from his bones. Men don't suffer well, sniffle weakly, see the face of God in a kidney stone, hamstring quad, calf on fire, Soften your face while the pain scintillates you. Every year, people die on the long pier that points in arrogance at Lake Michigan's blue pole. There's a stone there for rescuers who died trying to save what was lost. Run toward it. Know that you are running toward yourself. I just got two more, that's cool. Thank you for listening, guys. Um, this is another letter, a particular poem. Letter to my long distance lover while lying to myself. The day holds me between its knuckles, so I smash the French doors to consolation. Let's take the old gods out to the woods eat their dumb dross like goats. We can turn the goddamn grown-up world back into the playhouse where the real things are, where plastic hot dogs contain no nitrate, and the plastic baby is never hungry, and real beetles won't stop coming inside, but we forgive them. Let them live in our dirty hair like pets. We name each one, Astrophil, Desdemona, Frank. We are naked as the days we were born, Reagan's 80s, in hospitals with views of different Great Lakes. Bring it back to the woman's body, he says. Beautiful. I think of him as I run the sunset sidewalks later, obeying the rules. A mile in, I find it down tight, painted like the wing of a gull. I hear them talking when I wake in his bed, calling me to the things. All kites lead to the last day. My father, still my father in our house. Mama's grief. I asked her to buy me a kite that morning while she hid the news from me. And back to my running feet, back to the man who loves me and sees in my body a bird wing curved in flight. I seek the origin and find it. The term comes from jailbirds stripped of their feathers. I know this nakedness, this raw shame, and though there is no breeze tonight, I have risen haltingly above it. The mind will not behave. I give it all to my body instead. Today, it's light enough to bear the weight. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Okay, guys, it's the two of you left. <laughs> Take it. Uh, you want, who wants to go? Go for it. All right, I'll, I'll go for it. So, uh, I'm I'm Christian Christian Anton Gerard, and uh, I'm really I'm just super excited to be here with y'all tonight. Um, this is wonderful. Thank you, Helen. Thank uh, you. Thank you for supporting all of us and and 
and and the way that you support poetry in in, in doing this. Um, so this uh, this first poem is from um, my second book, Hold Fast, um, which was out um, a couple of years ago. And then I'll read some from um, this new thing, new thing that I'm, I'm making. Uh, but this this first one was a was a poem that um, that Helen first put in print. Um, it's called Defensive Poetry or the Poet Explaining Himself. I'd forgotten the moon last night would rise like most other nights because nights come dark and droning on for hours. While I'm scared, I've forgotten how to make a sentence or because the moon's poetry is bright cliche. When I tell someone I'm a poet, they say, I don't know anything about poems. Take the moon's picture tonight, I should say. Show it to a stranger. Ask if they see grief or grievance, joy. Ask if we sometimes gamble for the impossible because. Let's read a few from these. Um, so this is one I, um, this one's fun. This is more fun for, for me. I hope it's fun for you. So it's called, um, so this book uses my, um, I use myself in the third person a lot, um, which was a thing that happened um, because I, I, I uh, was listening to um, the Smiths one day in the in the park with my son. He was like two, and um, sweet and tender hooligan came on, and he was being a very sweet and and not so tender hooligan. Um, and I started saying his name, and then I started saying my name. Um, so then I started writing in my name. So Christian Anton Gerard to her, sort of in the style of a teenage love poem, and it's after Christian Anton Gerard and her. One. What I want to say sits on my lip, a wren and a rosebush at night, an orange moon and waiting. In the dark, silence is my palm up to my mouth, all the wishes breathe out. Hanging oak leaves against your eyes, restless in the breeze, keep me quiet and listening so I can follow you wherever you will smile. Two. Sometimes I hold cloves on my tongue, pour honey straight in my mouth when nobody's looking. I did it tonight, for the first time, three times. I plan to make it a thing. I've never told anyone this. Clove sting and honey burn. Fool for you. It's ours. Our doing. Three. I think of your hands with which I'm obsessed. Your hands holding flowers. Your hands holding a knife and fork. Your right hand rising to your mouth. How I imagine you will not move your eyes from mine as you eat. Your hands holding a book. The words rising from your mouth. There are metaphors for this. You are a heartbeat heard in a breath. You are a smile felt in night. You are red in red's history. Colors tricky to pin down. Light, a powerful stallion to break. Yes, light, a stallion. Have you heard the Highwayman song about the silver stallion? No matter. Cap heart never is better. Your hands and mine as it plays. Your thighs inside against mine. Because music works like alfalfa in wind. Your hands holding my face. My hands holding your back small. Two tulips in a vase. No, two tulips on a mountain's edge. How holding is organic. How holding on is not a mystery. How my hands on your face, yours on mine. Four, I said your name 49 times before I fell asleep last night. My voice fire pop and invitation. I'm all buzz and zing and you and yes and you and yes, yes. I dreamt your voice, breath in my ear. I woke a tulip field at sunrise. Um, so let's do one more from from this one. All right. Um, despite my best efforts, I can't really write many things other than love poems, um, which I guess is okay. <laughs> Christian Anton is a poem. <laughs> if every poem's a political poem, then so is every heartbeat. I didn't have my raincoat, and I've never bought an umbrella. Sometimes I get on an airplane, look at my shoes, and wonder, do I want to die in these shoes? When I think of an epigram, I think of a poem that's more. In this language, want is a word that means need. It feels like the tea kettle itself is made of amphetamines. I'm not culturally authorized to talk about that. Silence sometimes is all the ear can hold. Silence is not I, but contains multitudes. Sometimes it's the 17 minutes you give yourself when you see your choice like the harvest moon and you begin figuring how to soberly hold it. None of this stuff was here before. 
all the trees were smaller. I want my sweat to taste like good, good labor and dirt and grass. I want my name to taste like that in your mouth. Um, okay, so there were those. And then um, also, this is kind of a super, like a, like a triple special night in a lot of ways. Um, because Helen, Helen took the, the title poem to my first book, Moment Here, Collect for Stella, um, in 2013, and then some in these book. And then I'm, um, Darren and I uh, worked at the same bar when we were in college, and now we're both here um, reading poems about being sober. <laughs> this is true. Um, which I never thought I would write about um, that part of me, but and now I guess it, it it's just uh, it's it's everywhere. So these new poems are um, I don't know what to call this book. I've been calling them the tough guy poems, um, but that doesn't seem like a thing that will work. But maybe it will it will be what it is. I uh, like that. I like the tough guy poems in the title. Okay, cool. Well, I've I've, I've toyed with it because I keep trying to find. <laughs> Trying to find like a poety title for it, and I'm like, I don't know. He's this guy's kind of a he's like he's a you know he's kind of like a amateur boxer, and uh, he, he drag races and he hangs out by these railroad tracks. He's a small town guy. As long uh, as the cover is a stick figure with boxing, yeah. <laughs> and it says the tough guy poems, and it's a stick figure in boxing, yeah. like a teardrop. Yeah, but see, that's it. That's exactly it. You've already pegged him. He's not that tough. <laughs> um, all right, so here, here's some of these. Um, he's been he's been a blast. He's been a blast to write. Um, moonshine. First time I put high octane on my tongue, bottle red Everclear. Put my eyes on God, then open my throat like I was trying to swallow them stars. It's a big ass guy, bigger than a handle bottle. But you put handle after handle over your head, you start feeling like you're pulling yourself up by yourself. But if you're on a city street and watch a mime do that rope climb mime thing, you see both feet ain't ever off the ground at the same time. I grew up laughing at Casey Kasem each week saying, keep your feet on the ground and keep reaching for the stars. Who wants to be that tall? Something about being a person means looking at fire. Something about being me is trying to taste fire, not see it. Um, so this is a this is one in which he's a uh, he's talking about his, his sort of his boxing and um, filled my gloves with glass shards, cause filled my gloves with glass car with glass shards, cause if I can't pick my fights, I can prick my skin and see who stays for what's in me. I can't be less than dual four barrels wide open each Saturday night. I've tried, I've tried still till still. Even then, it's still, it's there. Fight's over and I'm still a short throw, six speed, long road here to where. Each night I throw a knife, miss the map, so I stay and run this same old strip. Them boys, I know, them boys know I stole my 671 blower straight out the shift lead's hands. Said I wrenched Michael's forward down state 30. I wrote some name. He saw my hands. You wrenching rose thorns? Said I play for keeps. He thought I meant pinks. I did, sort of. Shadow boxing's fun and all, but there's nights I need to hit something that'll make me fall. Why else I need another lead sled except to bloody my knuckles? Only man I lose to use me. If I'm lucky, I can drop me to my knees. I've also realized in writing these poems that I write a lot about wolves, which I did not realize before. Um, and it's kind of become a thing. I've just noticed that I, I write a lot about um, wolves, and also I'm 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 still wildly sort of obsessed with the idea of the cow, uh, American cowboy, in this weird way. Um, all right, let's, uh, so this one's called elapsed time. And when you're drag racing, that's the thing that matters is that not the not the overall time, but the elapsed time is from, is the time from which you you press go to to end. Elapsed time. The empty on the floorboard is the one that got me going like a wolf post equinox. Torx one force, blood's another. Vogue dishevelment's the company I keep. Black coffee, cowboy killers. I'm nothing without a chase. 
I don't want no one to know I got a sheriff in my chest. What's the point figuring what dreams mean when there's 12 rounds or a quarter mile? These bones ain't built for distance. Heart bored out 30 over, full race cam, torques one force, breaths another. Can't outrun my heart, it's shrunk full of moonshine. Some days I, some days I eat and some days I got a win to eat. Won't, won't have nothing fat in this life, ain't a choice. Bullet holes ain't nothing but holes. Call them air conditioning. Let's run, I say. County line, cross state line, cross next week, you say. Electric bills do. My life's got no dotted yellow. Clock on the wall is no friend of mine. Only two lines matter anyhow. Pain's its own flip side. Everything in me is running except at the line where my idol's pushing the edge of stall. Um, and let's read uh, two, two more here. This one's called Learning to Pray. In the beginning is the beginning again, the always word beginning with this thick root beg. To beg's how I began using my hands on a steering wheel, held up to my face like I was trying to hide something, but that's just how a boxer sees his hands back, says block. How a drag racer sees his fist on the gear shift, says go. Thinking it's time I tried, thinking about my hands is still. It's not needing to move to make minutes pass. No jab no block, no throttle. Before, right now, I thought life out in seconds, minutes, elapsed time between beginning and whatever's after that. After right now, time will still be, but maybe I'll lapse inside still, cut my hands instead of balling fists or gripping the steel, let something else win. All right, so this is the last one. So this one's called My Knuckles Learned. My knuckles learned a language that day. Don't know if she heard. Fancy she did. If fancy means fantasy, then when I come to her cold-handed, I fancy a heartbeat's, a heartbeat's breath breaking over itself. Five knuckles breaking into hers. My heart's hands unholstered. An unbroke Mustang's buck, not looking to break anything, but into full gallop. To get away, the getaway after, my heart held its six shooters to itself. When my knuckles pulled their hair triggers, nails shot out, grazed hers. How I fancied her heart held itself up too. Fancied our ten knuckles, our heart-sized fist unholding its breath, hearing itself in our ears. My heart don't have to justify begging Oblivion's blade to shave its neck before it rides. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, y'all. Okay. <laughs> um thank you again for this has been wonderful my goodness um so uh the piece that was published in uh crush is this piece um which i've decided to never read <laughs> because I don't want to impose a specific order on the way that it's read, because right. the point of it is confusion and spiritual journey and finding your own journey through, basically um, the, the word in the first box is God, and then there are variants and um, deviations and playing with that word a little bit. But when I started this project, um, I knew that I knew not very much about embroidery. And so I, this is my second embroidery ever. Um, but I knew that it was going to get a lot of knots in the back. And I wanted that, um, the knots and the gnarls to be part of the poem. So I, I printed the poem twice and I taped it together. And um, so this is the verso side of the poem. And I wanted the unintended to be visible and the mess to be visible and I um and and to see what happened as a consequence of having the poem on the reverse side so I was really grateful to Helen for taking this piece it was very outside my comfort zone and it, but it was a lot of fun I loved making it and since then I've made a bunch more and I've been having a lot of fun with those you know where to send those now <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I also am launching a first book. Uh, the, well, not 
launching a, uh, I don't, I, you, you have several books, Julian. Emily, I don't remember if you said if Sensorium is your first book. Uh, it's my second. Okay. So, so you've done the book launch before. This is my first book and it turns out to be a virtual launch. So I really have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> That's okay. None of us really do. <laughs> Exactly what I was going to say. Uh, Got to go on mute, baby's crying. So. Okay. okay. So um, I thought I would read the, the first piece that's in this poem, this, uh, the first piece that's in this book. Um, basically, it's a book about my ancestors' conversion to Mormonism and my deconversion and kind of putting the, those two pieces together. Um, one line of my family converted to Mormonism in the very early years after it was the, the Mormon church was established in 18. The church was established in 1830 and they converted in 1855 and um, made the journey from Northern England to Utah. And so this uh, first piece is a long kind of lyric essay uh, that opens up the book and it's called The Mormons Are Coming. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> the Mormons are coming. Mormons bring a handmade wreath of white mesh, silver ribbon, tinsel sprigs, a cheese and potato casserole, an offering of white lilies. Mormons bring a package of diapers, a green onesie, a purple turtle quilt. They bring a musical mobile that dangles Eeyore, Piglet, Tigger, and Pooh. They surprise you with a two-foot Christmas tree, white lights, red balls, and a golden star. They bring cranberry orange walnut bread, gingerbread, cinnamon rolls. They say, I'm sorry for your loss. They say, congratulations. They say, Merry Christmas. The Mormons are coming. They drink eggnog without rum. They drink Ovaltine and Postum. They drink Mountain Dew and Diet Coke in 32 ounce mugs. Energy drinks, yes. Coffee and tea, no. Alcohol, never. Mormons, rake your leaves. Weed your weeds. Babysit your kid while you go to the hospital to have another kid. Mormons build monuments of prairie families and covered wagons and hand carts. They hold the weight of family trees and martyrdom and pioneer blood in their cupped palms. They say, my ancestors knew Joseph Smith, donated their china for crushing to make the temples stucco sparkle, buried their massacred dead at Hans Mill. My husband says, my ancestor was Brigham Young's shoemaker, and there were a lot of little feet to shod. I say, my ancestor went to prison for polygamy, three wives, 19 sons, nine daughters, 107 grandchildren. Mormons bless their new babies in white, baptize their children in white coveralls and pinafores, white at their weddings, white in their temples, white when they're laid out in their coffins, an apron of green around their waists. They wear white undergarments woven with folkloric magic, bullets repelled, burns deflected. Mormons dot hills with electric spires, Nauvoo Temple, Salt Lake Temple, a temple in your neighborhood brazenly bright. The Mormons are coming. They come in the middle of the night when you have a blinding migraine. They come with consecrated olive oil and warm hands and baritone prayers. They come in the morning and sweep up the crying baby. They come in the afternoon and feed your cats, your turtles, your birds. Mormons bring a space blanket, a flashlight with extra batteries, a portable radio, a case of granola bars, a bucket of wheat, a crate of water. The Mormons are coming. 
by car, by bicycle, on foot. They knock on your door. They wear black name tags and glowing faces and shiny hope. I wore a name tag. Sir Kid, Église de Jésus-Christ des Saints des Derniers Jours. French in my mouth, a mangled nasturtium. They say, welcome to the neighborhood. They say, it's nice to meet you. They say, see you Sunday. Mormon men wear white shirts, dark suits, and power ties. They are clean cut, well shaven. Mormon women wear dresses or skirts in peach, spring green, lilac. A few rebels wear slacks. Mormons say, follow the prophet. They say, fathers preside. They say, men have priesthood, women have motherhood. Mormons gather for Sabbath in low church chapels. They shush their gigawatt kids and pass silver plates of torn wonder bread, trays of water in thimble sized paper cups. My daughters ask, why do only boys pass the sacrament? Mormons build a grand conference center with a waterfall welcome mat, a garden roof of native grasses and trees. They build it big enough to park two planes inside to gather Mormon masses from around the world. They arrange a room of plinths with the bronze busts of their prophets. My daughters ask, why are all the statues of men? Mormons issue proclamations a proclamation to wash away polygamy, a proclamation to define the family, marriage between man and woman only. They say families are forever and paint the words in cursive above their doors like a threshold blessing, a paschal lamb's blood. The Mormons are coming. Mormons put up Prop 8 signs. They make calls. They go door to door. They have practice going door to door. They say hate the sin, but not the sinner. They say it's a choice. They say gay is okay. Just stay celibate. And when a daughter, son, aunt, uncle, cousin, best friend, or comes out, my mother tells me I'm bisexual. I agonize for half a decade's doubt before deciding to leave. Mormons send priesthood holders. Mormons send sister teachers. Mormons send missionaries. And when I ask them to stop, they send a card every month, a card with no return address. The cards say, it's spring now, summer's here, autumn's coming. That's the first piece. Thank you for listening. I appreciate it. That was it. wonderful. <laughs> Thank Whoa. you. Do you have another, Dana? Thank you. Dana, do you have more? Um, I will. I will read the the title piece, and uh, because the mother, the book is called "If Mother Braids a Waterfall." Um, I'll read that title poem. It's short, <laughs> shorter, much shorter. <laughs> And then I'll, uh, I uh, made a poem embroidery of that as well, and I'll just show it to you um, after. Uh. And then I'll finish with that. This is the title poem, If Mother Braids a Waterfall. If mother braids a waterfall in a country where no one speaks her language. If she's a shrine, few bow to, few supplicate. If she's a book, no one reads. Verses rich as incantation. If mother weave a forest floor from tree roots in a swath of clear cut. If she untangles rivers into tributary threads, the beds long since dry. If she's a gold rush with no prospectors, a queen bee with no drones, honeycomb without attendants. If in the morning mother conducts a chorus of larks, if at night 
a throng of nightingales, if her children sleep through the song, if she holds a rope through an oubliette's trap door, calls down to us, but we focus on the guard, pushing grub through the bean slot once a day, his thrilling fingertips, his footstep echoing as he walks away. If we look up at last, if we relearn mother tongue through hard listening, if she's the one and only, not one of many, a clairvoyant of Egyptian glass in the stucco's arabesque, a gold theme for our brokenness, our shards, and a royal parched for the rain of our praise. If she's starscape, all dark and blaze, and hungry for our, our, for our eyes. So that's the title poem. And this is the uh, poem embroidery that I made. Um, that is so rad. It's so fun. I can't stop doing it. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> so oh, cool. And it's, uh, it, it's mostly embroidery thread, but it does have one, guitar, one busted guitar string um, Im embedded in there. So. Wow. I'm, I'm going to keep making them because I can't stop and it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all very much. This was wonderful for our first time, our first one. Um, I'm going to shut the recorder, right, Len? <laughs> I'm going to... I